Good morning and welcome brothers and sisters and all those visiting with us to this morning's worship service. <clears throat> the church council has the following announcements. With thankfulness to our Lord, after receiving overwhelming support at the congregational meeting, the church council has extended a call to Reverend A. Whitten from the Canadian Reformed Church of London, Ontario. We pray that the Lord be with Reverend and Sister Whitten as he considers the call to Baldivis and the needs to his current congregation. May the Lord direct his deliberations so he may see where the Lord requires him to serve. With thankfulness to our Lord, brother and sister Ed and Emily to heart with their three baptised children, Jamie, Emlyn and Cicely, have requested membership to our congregation. They have come to us from the Covenant Orthodox Presbyterian Church, St Augustine in Florida, which is a sister church to the Canadian Reformed Churches. After visiting with the family, the consistory joyfully grants the request. If there are no lawful objections, the membership will commence on the 5th of December. With thankfulness to our Lord, Sister Andrea Takaji has indicated her desire to public profess her faith. After examining her motives and knowledge, Consistory joyfully grants her request. If there are no lawful objections, the public profession of faith will take place, the Lord willing, on Sunday the 28th of November in the morning service. An attestation has been requested by brother and sister Nielsen and Jolene Plague with their two baptised children, Zane and Jarrah, to the Free Reformed Church of Kelmscott. And a baptismal attestation has been requested by Sister Shakira de Jong to the Free Reformed Church of Darling Downs. And the ordination of the office bearers will take place, Lord willing, in this afternoon's worship service. And so far the announcements. Please rise to receive the greeting of our Lord. Lift up your hearts unto God. Our help is the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise the name of God by singing from Psalm 78 verse 1, 2 and 3.
In his grace, God has established his covenant relationship with us. <clears throat> Reflecting on this covenant, the psalmist in Psalm 119 exclaims, You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame. Have my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. Let us now, as God's covenant people, listen to the ten words of the covenant and submit our lives to them as a rule for a life of thankfulness, which we'll read from Exodus 20, verse 1 to 17. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is heaven in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbour's. Christ taught us God's law in a summary. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us respond by singing from Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2.
We'll come before the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come bef- before you at the beginning of this worship service. Lord, you are the creator of the heavens and the earth and all things. Your creation was perfect, but through the instigation of Satan, man fell into sin and destroyed your perfect work. But Lord, in your grace, you have established a covenant, a relationship with us. In your grace, you have called us to be your children through the death and blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, you have addressed us with the ten words of the covenant. Let these commandments teach us our sins and misery and the need of a Saviour, and that we may live by these words in submission and as a show of thankfulness for all that you have done for us. We humble ourselves before you and place ourselves under your perfect word. Your testimony is sure, making the simple wise. Your word is the power to salvation to all who believe in you. Lord, we are by nature incapable of doing any good. We ask you to let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts to give light to our darkened heart and mind. Let us humble ourselves before you so that we do not trust in our own wisdom or in the wisdom of the world, but that through the hearing of your word we may know of your power and majesty and that our lives may be governed by it. Lord, we thank you that you have again called us to your house. You have given us a day to rest from our daily work, but that does not make it a day to use for our own leisure. You have given us this day to worship you. Let us diligently attend church to hear your word and to call upon your name and to offer our gifts to you. Lord, we ask that you accept the thank offerings that we may give this morning for the needy theological students. Lord, be with the two students from our congregation, brothers Damon and Mitchell Boswell, and with all the students who are studying at the seminary. Lord, we are thankful that we can assist them financially and through our prayers. Let us all acknowledge that this help comes from your fatherly hand. And we pray that you may equip the professors with the wisdom and a measure of the Holy Spirit so that they may be able to teach these men to become ministers of your word. Lord, this morning we may listen to a sermon about what it means to repent. For Christ is on his way. Christ is coming soon and we must not be complacent and our repentance must be real. Lord, we ask you to be with the reader this morning that he may read clearly and let the Holy Spirit work in all of us so that we may listen attentively, so that we may increase the knowledge of you and that it may strengthen our faith in you. Lord, forgive all the sins, not because we deserve it, but in Jesus Christ's name alone. Amen. You now have the opportunity to give of your gifts to the Lord. The collection this morning is for needy theological students. After the thank offerings have been collected, we'll sing from Psalm 51, verse 1, 3, and 4.
Today we may hear a sermon prepared by Reverend Reuben Bradenhoff from the Free Reformed Church of Mount Azura. And for scripture reading, he has chosen Luke 3, verse 1 to 20, and his text from the same chapter, verse 7 up to 9. So we'll first read Luke chapter 3, verse 1 up to 20. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said therefore to the crowds that came to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abram as our father. For I tell you, God is, able to, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree therefore that does not Bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptised and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorised to do. Soldiers also asked him, and what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. And the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ. John answered them all, saying, I baptise you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all that he locked up John in prison. You can now read the verses from the, for the text, which is from verse 7 up to 9. He said to the crowds that came out to be baptised by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abram as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. <clears throat> Beloved in Christ, it is a great privilege being a minister of God's word, yet preaching is a difficult job. What makes it hard is not really the years of study beforehand, it is not the many hours spent every week writing sermons, it is not even getting over the fear of public speaking. Preaching is difficult because of what the word means. It is a serious word, a word of great consequence. A minister has the privilege of bringing the word of salvation, 
But that very same message is also a word of judgment. In the Bible, those two always go together, salvation and judgment. They are inseparable. Because if I tell you that salvation is available through faith in Christ, then the opposite is also true. Those who do not believe will miss out on this gift and are under God's holy wrath forever. Even if we do not say it exactly like that every Sunday, that is always the implication. If you do not accept this gospel, there is no life or redemption, only death. For if the text has been faithfully explained, if Christ has been preached, then the minister's words must be received for what they actually are, the word of the living God. Many receive the word with faith. We thank the Lord for this grace, but sadly other people, maybe even some who are here today, reject it. They do not care for the gospel. They have not believed in Christ or really repented from their sins. This makes preaching hard. You wish you could be more convincing, more persuasive, that you could cause everyone to respond in the right way. But in the end, the one who brings the word knows that it is not his own. It is God's word. And that means that God takes care of the results. Almighty God works all the change that is needed. These are the truths that John the Baptist surely held on to. For him too, being a minister of the word was not easy. He preached to all who would listen, calling them to repentance and faith. But even as he did, some turned away, and some others did not care. But this was God's word, a word of salvation and judgment, and he would continue to bring it boldly. And that is our theme. John preaches... Repent, for Christ is on his way. And we'll see this in the following three points. The time is urgent, some are complacent, and the repentance must be real. And I'll just repeat that. The theme, John preaches, repent, for Christ is on his way, with the following three points. The time is urgent, some are complacent, the repentance must be real. The time is urgent. Something big is about to happen in the Gospel of Luke. It happens in verse 2. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. This is the same kind of language used to describe the Old Testament prophets. The word of God came to Ezekiel or Jeremiah or whomever. And whenever the word of God comes, his messengers must speak. So John begins. He goes into the region of the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Read that in verse 3. When we hear baptism, we probably picture a nice baptismal font. We see an infant presented by the parents, and that solemn ceremony of sprinkling water. We are used to baptism. And the Jews knew something about ceremonies of washing. There were lots of this in the law, as a part of being cleansed from impurity. There were also some fringe groups in Israel who had a ritual, something like baptism. And if there were Gentiles who wanted to join God's people, but they did not want to undergo the pain of being circumcised, they could be baptised. So people knew about different kinds of baptism, washings with water. But John's message was something new. For he stood at the edge of the Jordan and called people to come into the water. Baptism was for everyone, for everyone who saw the need to change their ways. The word of God came to John in the wilderness, who said that now is a time for repentance, now and not later, is a time for you to begin a different way of life. What makes his call so urgent? Why does he preach with such conviction? Well, think of what John's main task was, to prepare for the coming of Christ. Jesus was on his way, coming to deal with human sin once and for all. He was going to take away guilt and shame and make possible a new relationship with the Lord. When he comes, he will open up God's grace to you in a new way. John said to everyone gathered, when Christ comes, he will bring salvation with him. But to receive him, you have got something to do. You need to confess your sins. To be ready, you need to repent. The same call comes with the preaching of the gospel every Sunday. We hear the word of salvation and we have to believe. 
accept it with our heart of faith and trust. But we must also repent. What does that mean? The Greek word here for repentance is literally a change of mind. It means we change our minds about ourselves. We change our mind about our sin. We change our minds about God. And that is not something merely intellectual or mental. Repentance is not only a matter of having the right information, knowing the proper theology. It is a deeply personal, a matter of the heart. Repentance is coming to see how lowly we are, how helpless we are, how sinful. It means coming to grips with our sacred idols and our addictions and unholy ways and sinful reactions. We change our mind about ourselves because we see how much we need grace. At the same time, repentance is seeing that God is our, only, is our one and only hope. We come to understand that it is only because of the Lord's great mercies that we are not consumed. By the grace of his Spirit, this is the beginning of a new life. And true forgiveness cannot take place without it. That is John's point. If you will receive this Christ and share in his salvation, your heart has to be ready. Be ready with a broken heart, a contrite heart. That is when I finally realised my own responsibility for all the sins I've committed. I cannot blame anyone else. I will not blame anyone else. But I completely accept my guilt. And I admit that I, what I have done has caused a deep offence to God. In our life, nothing will get better if we do not face up to our sin. If we do not repent... Our guilt will only be deepened, and we will drift further away from God. But by repentance, we are made ready to approach the throne of grace, and it is then that God will receive us. This is the message that John brought in all urgency, and he attracted big crowds with, and he attracted big crowds with these words. His preaching was a breath of fresh air after all the legalistic ramblings of the Pharisees. Lots of people came, but unfortunately, not everyone was serious about starting over. He said to the multitudes that came out to be baptised by him, brood of vipers, that was from verse 7. No one could miss the point of these words. In the Old Testament, vipers represent the enemies of God. A viper is deceitful and dangerous and full of venom. And there is something else about snakes. They always know when danger is near. That is exactly what brought some people to John. They could sense that the time was urgent. They could feel the heat being turned up. So they want some life insurance by getting baptised. John sees through their deceit. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? It's from verse 7. Baptism will not save you, he says. It is not an immunity card in case you run into trouble. No. If we have received baptism, then our lives must also change, and more on that a bit later. But first, we remember that whenever salvation is near, judgment is close behind. That beautiful opportunity you once had can become a terrible tragedy if you do not respond in time. Those gospel words that I hear every Sunday, the baptism that I once received, these might be the very things that testify against me. Even now, John warns, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. It's from verse 9. Picture being in a forest, looking for firewood, and you see a tree. You fuel up your chainsaw and you get it ready, and you place it near the tree. All it takes is for someone to pick it up and start cutting. That is what these days are like, says John. The axe is ready, judgment is near. The coming of Christ means that it is decision time. The thoughts of many hearts will soon be revealed. What do you think of the Christ? And if the time was urgent back then, then it is only more urgent now. The Saviour has already come, and he has gone, and, he is, and soon he is coming again. The days are short. The end is near. We see the evidence. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. So before judgment comes, we announce that there is available new life in Christ. There is a way to move beyond the guilt of our past sins. There is a way to be cleansed, not just outwardly, but inwardly. Even to the deep places of the soul, even the worst things we have done can be covered by the blood of Christ, 
scrubbed away forever. You can be free to live in the joy of salvation. Ask for God's help to change your mind, to think differently about yourself, about the living God, about the total need for his, change, for his grace. If you come in a lowly spirit to God, he will never reject you. This is wonderful to hear this gospel. But it also needs to be declared that when there is no repentance, God's wrath will come. It is for our own good that scripture says, if there is no fruit, then the tree should be cut down and thrown into the fire. That sounds very serious, because it is. It is urgent. It is time to repent, to repent and not be complacent. And that brings us to the second point. Some are complacent. There is an old saying that a preacher's job has two parts, that he is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. To guilty people and hurting people, the word of God gives rich consolation. And to people who are lukewarm and lazy, the word gives strong admonition. This is precisely what John the Baptist does. Many people who come to him assume they were good people. After all, they were God's chosen ones, part of Israel, members of the covenant. Was not their salvation practically guaranteed? So when John preached about repentance, they asked, that might be necessary for the really sinful people, but do we also need to repent, like he is saying? There is not much we need to do to prepare ourselves, is there? We are God's covenant people after all. But John knows what his audience is like, so he cuts them short. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abram as our father. That's from verse 8. This was just the answer some people thought. They had their status as the children of Abram, a place before God. And it is true, belonging to the covenant of grace is an incredible blessing. To many people who live and die without hearing what we have heard or not receiving what we have received, yet... Do you hear what John says? Baptism or church membership is no substitute for a changed life. God seeks a repentant heart. You must be born again. Think about how we are not so different from John's audience. We too are members of the covenant, part of God's people. Being baptised is a great gift, together with receiving God's promises. But what if... You have never truly confessed your sin and put them to death. What does it mean if we still have not gone to Christ for cleansing? It is easy to be complacent. If you have grown up in a Christian home and always gone to church and even a Christian school, there is probably not much, there is probably much that is good in your life. You have good habits, good manners, much that is outwardly acceptable. People might even commend you for being a hard and honest worker and having lots of Bible knowledge. Yet these good things sometimes give false sense of comfort. They can keep us from facing the hard questions of what lies beneath. Is there humble faith in Christ? Is there repentance from sin? Do I have a real love for God and a real love for other people? Somewhere along the line, people might trust in entirely the wrong thing. We have Abram as a father. We belong to the right church. We have the water of baptism on our forehead. It is something for all of us to reflect on. Have we missed the one thing that God really seeks? Thankfully, John puts us on the right path. It is the path of repentance. With our whole life, we must turn to the Lord. We, must, we seek to depend on Christ with all our heart. And that begins simply with recognising our sins and repenting from them. So what are my sins? Can I name them? Can I bring them into the open? This takes some self-reflection, some soul-searching. What sins do we tolerate in ourselves? Are there any bad habits which I have come to accept in my life? Maybe it is wrong ways, like proud ways, or hostile ways of thinking about other people or it is impure sexual desires, or it is some treasured idol? Are there any sins I have tried to hide from the eyes of everyone? Will we be honest about these sins and acknowledge them? And if we will confess our sins, where do we go? 
if you know how you have failed, that you cannot do it on your own, go to the Saviour in faith and love and worship. Put your trust in him as Lord. Depend on him as your one hope and comfort in this fallen world. And let us realise something else as the covenant people of God, as his church. The truth is, God does not need us. Yes, God has sworn his faithfulness to us, but the Lord can raise up believers anywhere. God can receive worship well enough without us. This is what John says to the Jews. I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. It's from verse 8. If God can create the whole world out of nothing, he can do this. If he can create a nation out of senior citizens like Abram and Sarah, then God can create people who will love and obey him. This is a real warning. If he does not find faith, God can move on. And in the years after Christ, this is what God did. Many of the Jews would not accept the Messiah. So God sent his gospel to the Gentiles, even to all the nations. From these stones he would raise up the children of Abraham. Beloved, we are these stones. We have been graciously included, now invited into God's family through Christ. But there is still no room for false comfort. From his covenant people, from you and from me and everyone here, God is seeking faith, and he is seeking fruits. Yes, fruits of faith. And that brings us to the third point. The repentance must be real. After calling, warning, and baptizing, John had another question for the people at the Jordan. The question was this. What would they look like after they received baptism? They would be dripping wet, sure. They might have gone on their way smiling and relieved. But if we have really believed in God and repented of sins, then our life will look different from before. And that is the force of verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. Baptism has value, but what does it produce? It requires that we live a daily gratitude for forgiveness that we, will, that we show we are now committed servants of the Lord. In other words, repentance is not an abstract activity. It is not a word from the catechism. Repentance is something you can see. It is a visible response to the grace of God. As we draw on the sweet waters of his grace, there will surely grow fruits on our branches. In the first place, true repentance changes our relationship with God. If you know yourself to be a desperate sinner, but now a forgiven and cleansed sinner, you will begin to love God. You will thank God and worship him. Repentance transforms how you relate to God. Now you want to spend time with the Lord. You want to listen to him. Your greatest joy is knowing God and knowing him better. In the second place, repentance shifts our relationship with, with other people. It is this aspect which receives the emphasis in our text. Turning away from sin must shape how we treat those around us. We treat them with grace and gentleness. We treat them with mercy and meekness. The person who is forgiven becomes a forgiving person. You hear this in John's answers to the crowd. In the following verse, they ask, What shall we do then? It's verse 10. They have understood his point about bearing fruit. So they seek application. What are the results of this repenting? John says, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. That's from verse 11. In other words, show kindness and be loving. That is always a mark of true repentance when it changes what you actually do towards others and you share your possessions and relieve suffering. And this will mean different things for every different person. There are two more examples in our chapter. The tax collectors ask what they should do and John tells them to collect only what is required and to stop stealing. Some soldiers too 
ask what they should do. And John says, they should no longer take advantage of people. If you have repented, then these are real and concrete changes you will make. We should all say the same thing. What shall we do? It is asked by the repentant husband and the repentant wife. It is asked by the young person who wants to repent from his sin and by the child and by the older member. What will be the results of the repentance in my life? How will I show my response to the gospel? We always want to answer that in practical ways. Repentance is concrete. If there has been a specific sin, then we seek to change. If I've been making an idol out of money, I stop and begin to delight in the Lord alone. If I've been putting impure things in front of my eyes, I stop and pursue better things. If I've been getting furious with my family, repentance means I stop and I seek God's grace for self-control. If, I've, if I have been neglecting prayer, then I seek to begin again and to create new habits. There are countless examples. The point is that repentance means change. What was I doing before I repented? What kind of life was I leading before? And how will things be different now? How will I begin to put things right? And that is not a one-time question, but it is asked again and again, day after day. What shall we do? We bear fruit. We bear fruit for the glory of God who saved us. In all this, let us remember that the time is urgent. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the tree. This is a serious warning, but it is spoken in love, because God wants us to live. For all those who repent from sin, he promises his never-failing grace. For all who turn in faith to Jesus Christ, there is the joy and peace and comfort of knowing him. So pray for God's help to change. Ask for his strength for repentance. And he will surely come near and show grace. Amen. Let us now sing from him 70 verse 1, 2, 3 and 4.
In our prayer, we remember that Sister Carla Smith can celebrate her birthday today, and we'll also remember some of the announcements that was read before the service. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your sovereign grace. You have chosen your children before the foundation of the earth. You have sent your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross and to pay for all of our sins. You give us your spirit so that we believe in Christ as our only saviour. You have placed us in this congregation and have given us the covenant promises that you are our father and we are your children. Lord, please give us a repentant heart and let us confess our sins to you and repent from all that we do that offends you. Let us have a change of mind about our sin, that we put all evil away from us and that we turn to you in humbleness. Let us show in our life in the way that we serve and worship you and how we show love to those who are around us and show compassion and care to those in need. Lord, let us do this today and not wait till next week or next year. Let us be ready for Christ's return on the final day or when you call us home to eternal glory so we may stand before you washed clean in Christ's blood. Father, we acknowledge the weakness of our faith we are not immune to the problems that the Jews experienced in our passage. Father, we too are weak and sinful, so we ask for your help. Please help us to look Christ, to, to Christ constantly. Let your Holy Spirit dwell in all of us richly, so that more and more we may look and act like Christ is our head. Lord, we thank you that you have directed Sister Andrea Takaji and brother and sister Ed and Emily Tart with the children to our congregation. Lord, be with them as they find their place among us and be with us as congregation that we may make them feel welcome so that together we may serve you. Lord, today we can share our joy with Sister Carla Smink who can celebrate her birthday today. Be with her and be with all those who can celebrate their birthday this week. We thank you that you have been with them in the past year and we pray that you will continue to surround us all with your care in the coming year. There are members among us who have recently lost loved ones or have had to deal with a miscarriage. Be with them as they deal with their grief. Be with those who have health concerns. Some are recovering from operations or treatments. Others have to deal with mental illness, personal struggles or loneliness. We pray, Lord, that you may give these brothers and sisters patience and strength and healing and that as the body of Christ we may be there to support each other in our varying needs. Lord, give all of us the comfort that we are not our own, but that we belong with our body and soul, both in life and death, to our faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. And Lord, so assure us of our eternal life. Lord, we ask you to bless the bond of marriage, so that there may be harmony between husband and wife. Work in us to be faithful to each other, so this bond may grow stronger, and that it may reflect the love Christ has for his church. Be with parents, that we may teach our children to serve you, Lord, be with the children, that they may obey the parents and live in a way that shows that we are created in your image. Be with those to whom you have not given children or to those who desire more children, that this has not happened. And be with those who are single, those to whom you have not given a marriage partner. Lord, hear their prayers, and if it is your will, grant their request. Grant them patience, that they may wait on you and show them and all of us the tasks that you have for us as servants in your kingdom. Be with the politicians and those who are in the armed forces, the police force, employers and everyone that is in a position of authority. Let them rule in a way which shows honour to your name. Lord, we thank you that we could place a call to Reverend Whitten to be our minister. Be with Reverend and Sister Whitten as he considers this call to Baldivis and as he considers the needs of his current congregation and direct his deliberations that he may see where you require him to serve. Lord, be with us as congregation as we communicate with them in the next weeks. We have been without our own minister for the past three years and we pray that you will fill this vacancy. Lord, you know the struggles that we have faced and are facing. But Lord, you have not left us on our own. Let us continue to look for Christ as the great shepherd. He is the head of the church and in him we put our trust. Lord, be with the visiting ministers and the elders. Continue to give them what they need so they may faithfully bring your word here in this church every Sunday. Be with the deacons as they distribute your gifts to those who are in need. 
and as they care for the elderly, the sick, and the lonely in your congregation. Be with the elders as they shepherd your flock, that they may watch diligently, that no, no false teaching may creep into your church. And be with those who labour in various tasks in your congregation. Bless the work that is being done, so that as a congregation we may show our love to you and to our neighbour. Let us learn from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. He is Lord and King with all authority. Yet he humbled himself even unto death to bear your wrath against our sin. Lord, now through the sacrifice of Christ, we ask you to forgive all our sins which we commit daily and let the Holy Spirit work in our hearts so that we may fight against all of our sins and evil desires. Lord, this we ask not because we deserve it, but in Jesus Christ's name alone. Amen. Let us now sing from hymn 15, verse 1, 2 and 3. Let us lift up our hearts unto God and pray for the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.